Hello, my name is Rob Corliss. This talk is about teaching linear algebra in a mechanized environment. The slides are available at my webpage, um, rcorliss.github.io at the link there, and I recommend that you download the slides because they have the links. This is joint work with David Jeffrey and Azar Shakuri. So the context of what we're doing is that teaching computational mathematics is increasingly important. Many different applications which are uh, of great and increasing importance in modern society. Um, teaching computational mathematics is difficult because computational mathematics involves several things at once. Mathematics, programming, complexity, and numerical stability. And the last is because of the compromises necessary for efficiency. We don't use floating point arithmetic just because we like it. We use it because we have to, to get stuff done. There are new tools, new methods, and new topics arising continually. And in teaching, if we want to incorporate these new things, that means we have to remove old things because we all have only finite time to teach. And the students are learning other things than computational mathematics as well. Uh, it's also now well understood and supported by data that active learning is by far the most effective way to learn. So we have to teach in a way that supports active learning. So this talk is actually going to focus on linear algebra. Uh, before I begin, I just want to give a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. This is one of my favorites. I won't read it to you, but I'll let you have a look yourselves. And it is kind of hard to compete with the machines. So isn't technology taken into account for education already? Uh, the answer is no, at least not everywhere. There have been pretty intense arguments about this for at least 50 years. Maybe the best paper on the subject is Bruno Buchberger's 1990 paper, Should Students Learn Integration Rules? And as I said in the slides, there's a link. Uh, in that paper, he summarizes uh, a resolution of previous fierce discussions with colleagues into what is now known as the white box, black box principles. And I'll talk about that in, in detail. But not everybody knows this. For example, let's look at this bad example of an exam question from my own uh, university. So if you just search on the web, we find uh, the following question from a 2022 Math 1600 exam, that's a linear algebra course, at Western. And in that exam, no calculators or cell phones are allowed. So the question is, find the inverse of this matrix, 2, 1, 0, 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 1, 1. This question is obsolete in at least two ways. First, nearly anything that can be done with the matrix inverse can be done without it. So in, you really computing the inverse is really a specialized topic. Maybe some statistics classes actually need it. The second part of this obsolescence is who in the world does inversion of three by three matrices by hand? Uh, you just don't need it. 40 years ago, there were calculators that could do it. So maybe a better question to do with this matrix, just, just uh, looking ahead a little bit is, does this matrix factor into a lower triangular and upper triangular factor without pivoting? And you can't tell without actually doing it. So the reason this is a more interesting question is that matrix factorings are far more Im important nowadays than uh, matrix inverses. Okay, there's an example of a bad question. What are we gonna be talking about? Linear algebra. Linear algebra is the first course where the student encounters algebra, analysis, and geometry all together at once. Uh, that was Velvil Kahan talking about linear algebra education to me. Uh, at the Linear Algebra Conference in Minneapolis in 1991. 
And you could see Kahan's paper, Mathematics Written in Sand, uh, for an early and prescient view of the use of computational environments as computational laboratories. He envisaged the student as being an active explorer. Now, some of the things that were addressed in Kahan's paper and are addressed in a lot of the numerical analysis literature are the challenges from floating point arithmetic. And it turns out that those challenges are actually very old. So admit, for instance, the existence of a minimum magnitude, and you will find that the minimum which you have introduced, small as it is, causes the greatest truths of mathematics to totter. And this is Aristotle from On the Heavens. Uh, and it's true. So if you introduce the smallest possible number, which you have to do for floating point arithmetic, then it breaks all kinds of things. So one of the things that it breaks is that floats are not associative. So A plus B plus C gives you different answers depending on the order in which you do the arithmetic. So for example, take a, a large number M, about the mass of the moon, minus M plus M plus one, that gives you zero, while minus M plus M plus one gives you one. And this really discombobulates students. Uh, another thing that bothers them is uh, uh, unsigned integer, 32-bit integers. And it breaks the model of how arithmetic works in the world for students. And we as educators have to enable students to deal with floats and unsigned integers. And one has to rethink mathematical proofs in these contexts. All right, proofs in a first linear algebra course. There are some things one might like to prove in the first course. You might like to prove that Kramer's rule works. I'm perfectly well aware that Kramer's rule is uh, very frequently an inefficient method for solving uh, linear systems, but nonetheless, there are situations where it does work and there are situations where you actually want to think about it. But in any case, the proof is very pretty. You might want to do that. You might want to prove that the normal equations, so AHA times the vector X is equal to AHB, where H, AH is the Hermitian transpose, and that gives the least square solution to AX equals B over the complex numbers. Um, then the proof can be done just straight with inequalities without calculus, and it's a very interesting proof to do that. You might want to prove the matrix determinantal lemma there's a nice discussion at Wikipedia about that. So, okay, well, there's proofs in a first year linear algebra course that you might want to do. Um, you might want to think about what it means to actually give a proof. So there's a lovely uh, blog post by Keith Devlin, uh, what is a mathematical proof? And he says in there that proofs are stories that convince suitably qualified others that a certain statement is true. Well, it's our job as educators to train people so that they are qualified. Big problem in North America is that normal students are not exposed to proofs in high school anymore. Here's a bunch of facts and here's what they do and they do some computation and write some, but they don't do proofs anymore. No, and th this has largely been because there's no more high school, no more Euclidean geometry in high school. So students need motivation when they do encounter proofs because they're hard. And normally they encounter their first proofs in the first linear algebra course. We contend that programming can provide such a motivation. Ed Barbeau, uh, who is a professor at the University of Toronto, says that there should be no proof without doubt, doubt on the part of the students. Meaning if the students don't doubt the statement, proving it is counterproductive. The physicist of my acquaintance, Henry Barbonell, said, I have absolutely no interest in proving things that I know are true. <laughs> anyway, having the students write programs and encounter bugs can be very motivating. They might be interested in proving their programs correct after that experience. They should try to prove those things by hand. We think that only then will the concept of an automatic prover have any meaning for them. Because otherwise, it's just another oracle. Uh, teacher says that this is true. The computer says that this is true. Okay, I believe you. Let's expand on that a little bit. Um, a classic proof of existence or uniqueness 
in pure mathematics is something like proving that a program terminates. Uh, for applied mathematics, and in particular when floating point arithmetic is involved, what is frequently needed is a proof that when a program terminates, it gives the exact answer to a nearby question. Now, this involves the original non-mathematical context, so it's not simple to make programs do this kind of thing. Well, I went page up instead of page down. Sorry about that. So let's go back to uh, the issue of the use of technology in education, uh, Bookberger's white box, black box. In his 1990 paper, he outlines this principle for teaching mathematics in a mechanized environment. When the student is learning a particular concept the first time, for instance, determinant, the student is not allowed to use the determinant routine. They have to do their computations by hand. But when the student is using the concept and learning more advanced things, for instance, Kramer's rule, then they are allowed to use the determinant routine. Well, why is that true? Well, it turns out that people need a certain amount of human action to internalize a concept. Once they've internalized a concept, we can say that the concept has become an answer and not a question. Now, it's true that this rule can be run in different ways. You can use black box for a while and get the students to, to explore what does this box do? And then you open up the box to see what's inside it. Um, but it's a good rule to think about it, and it's a good rule for teaching. We've used it very well. We've used it very successfully over the years. Now, again, Bookberger is thinking of the student as being an active participant, an active explorer, not just listening. Now, we as educators have already changed because of Wolfram Alpha. Homework assignments already have to be different. Then there's Chegg and Math Overflow and Maple Primes and many more. This puts more weight on exams. And I'm not going to talk about ChatGPT. Um, if you have exams that use technology, then it's more stressful for the student. We've had lab equipment failures, software failures, uh, transfer of the exam to the uh, from their computer to the repository failures, lots more. And it's harder to invigilate because you're, if you're giving students access to a computer, well, then they can discreet message to their to their friends to ask the question. So you have to watch carefully. But going the no technology route requires banning cell phones, and that's illegal in some countries. Can't do that. You're not allowed to take cell phones away from people because it's their emergency um, first first tool in the use of emergencies. And anyway, banning technology limits the kind of question you can ask. So it, it also limits the student interest in learning technology. If it's not on the exam, they don't want to know it. Okay, well, here's an exam question that involves technology. And you don't actually have to have technology uh, available during the exam. It's just here... Maple gives the, follow, the, the output above. Is it correct? Is it correct and complete? Does the answer to this question depend on the original non-mathematical context of the problem? So if you can read this, this is a two by two linear system question. The matrix is, the first row is A and one, and the second row is one and one. And the right-hand side vector is A minus one and zero. And the third line there is X is assigned the solution of uh, AX equals B. That's ma maple syntax for the solving a linear system. And maple says that the solution is the vector one and minus one. The question is, is that correct? Um, I'll leave that for discussion. A possibly better activity than going over uh, proofs just on their, on their own, is to take the inductive proof of something, say the modified Gram-Schmidt process, and I've got a YouTube video on that, which is uh, surprisingly popular, for, well, surprising to me that it's popular, but anyway, uh, and take that induction and write a recursive program to compute the QR factoring of an arbitrary rectangular matrix with c complex entries. Then prove that the program is correct. 
test your program on matrices with complex entries. Is the output of your program continuous with respect to the input data? And in fact, that's a really hard problem. So their answer is, the answer is no, it will not be continuous. If they have one, if the student comes up with one that is continuous, I would be very interested in that. All right, so here we have some reflections. One of my students long ago uh, came into my office and, and complained about the use of technology in the engineering math courses we were teaching. She said, what good does the technology do? I mean, I liked plug and chug. Now I have to think about what the answer means. This made me very happy. Actually, she got mad at me that I was so happy about this question. And then, then she said, no, no, now I get it. Okay, that, that, that making the students think. Of course, that's our goal. But, you know, as this maple question, which some of you would have noticed, would, would have said, well, in the case of uh, the problem of case dissection, deciding whether A is equal to one or not, uh, is hard. It's exponentially complicated in the number of variables. One variable is not too bad. We're perfectly fine. Exponential in one is fine. Um, but the program needs the user to tell it about the assumptions on the variables. So it needs input because it needs discussion about the context of the problem. The third reflection is using technology requires training. So most programming syntax was not at all obvious to me before I learned it. And if you stand up in front of a class and just assume that it's all intuitive, oh yes, your students can learn Python on the weekend. Uh, some can, but many cannot. So we actually do need to make space for the teaching of mathematics in or teaching of, of technology use, responsible technology use in our courses. And we need to rethink our exam questions in the light of student needs, which have changed with the changing environment. So I talked about this in uh, 20 years ago in my uh, computer mediated thinking paper in the context of calculus. And you can have a look at that. All right, which technology do we use? One wants to reduce, reuse, and recycle. Instead of using a calculus tool in one course and a linear algebra tool in another, and a statistical tool in yet another, you, you want as much as possible to use the technology. So Jupyter Notebooks right now are extremely popular and general purpose. So people can at least learn a single interface and that can help. And one, there are many kernels one can connect to. So you can connect Maple, Mathematica, MATLAB, Python, R, Sage Math, and so on. So there's lots of freedom for religious wars about which, which uh, technology to use. We claim there are several mathematical notions that are strengthened by uh, programming. You can use mathematical induction to prove correctness of a program. You can use mathematical induction to design a recursive program. The real analysis and floating point arithmetic actually strengthen each other rather a lot. Epsilon delta proofs actually translate into proving programs are numerically stable. Practice with functions is always useful. And simply working with visualizations improves people's feel for a lot of things, including geometry. It's a bit scary though to make changes to simple first courses like the linear algebra course because they may have significant downstream effects. Uh, who will benefit? Will anybody be harmed? And do we really have to change? So some dumb things that were true about old fashioned lecturing was train students to sit still for 50 minutes. Is that a useful skill nowadays? Maybe. We train them to take notes. We train them to uh, follow an argument when somebody was was presenting an argument. Is that the kind of thing that we want them to know? So I still think there's room for lecturing. Uh, but we maintain that there are big ideas, that the big ideas can be taught better with an active technology. So you can teach functions better, you can teach continuity, you can teach limits and convergence. You can teach what I call reductionism, which is the idea of breaking a problem up into small pieces, solving the small pieces and putting them back together again. Uh, there's a lovely discussion of this in Stephen Strogatz's uh, book, Infinite Powers. Maybe we can teach proof better with technology. In summary, 
the environment in which our students use mathematics has changed. The mathematics we teach must change with that. Not only the methods, but also the topics must change. The students need active training in the responsibility use of technology, and that means we have to keep up with the technology. Sadly, the reactionaries are winning in some places now. They're just teaching stuff the old-fashioned way because that's the way they've always done it and they don't see the need, need to change. But I do not think they, that they should be allowed to win overall. Thank you for listening.